It's time for another episode of Corner of the Galaxy from the Box. The show that gets you behind the scenes of the LA Galaxy and into the minds of soccer reporters and MLS experts. Your hosts for the day are Corner of the Galaxy's Josh Guessman and LA Times soccer reporter Kevin Baxter. Let's start the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Coming to you from COG Studios on a wonderful Monday, September 2nd. That's right. Happy Labor Day, everybody. Uh, Hope everybody's enjoying their weekend. We are currently in the studio getting you ready for another week of LA Galaxy soccer. Actually, an off week of LA Galaxy soccer. Uh, But want to get over the LA Galaxy's 4-3 loss to the Seattle Sounders on Sunday afternoon. A loss that uh, certainly rings some alarm bells and a loss which result really doesn't help the Galaxy one bit. I don't think there's any panic here, but there's a lot to talk and a lot to discuss. All right, to help me do that, it is the panda himself, Mr. Kevin Baxter. How's it going, buddy? All right, how are you? I am, uh, as you know, I'm two days into my seventh decade on this planet. I was going to say, I was going to just wish you a happy birthday and tell everybody that, you know, you're about 80 years old. Um, and then and, Yeah, just about. And then I was going to let you correct me, but, um, but happy birthday. Six, 60 years old on Sunday, uh, which is 197 in Panda years. That's right. and, and think about this. I'm probably old enough to be your dad. Maybe I am. That's, I don't think so. I, in fact, I'm, I'm positive you're not. Um, in fact, that's a horrible thought. Let's not ever go. <laughs> let's never go there again. But um, no. Uh, yeah. You're, are you old enough to be? My, no. My dad is older. So I guess I guess you are old enough technically to be. You would have had to have been a, yeah. a young dad in order to pull yeah. that off. I, I don't I don't see that one from you. It's physiologically possible. It, I, probably not. I guess there's lots of things that are physiologically possible. One thing that's not physiological possible, however, is the LA Galaxy to go back and uh, and get a victory over the Seattle Sounders. A, a 4-3 result, a game that saw. Uh, what four goals in the last 15 minutes there, Kevin? Yep, uh, yep, and 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 two two by each team. So the Galaxy with a furious rally, it kind of fell short. Well, I guess it did fall short, but you know, I it, there's a lot of gnashing of teeth and despair over this. The Galaxy fought so hard and and came out uh, with nothing. And in fact, as as we were talking about before the show, um, only Joe Corona, who was a substitute, he's the only person who addressed the media that we know of, in addition to Guillermo Barascolota, the only person that addressed the media after the game, is that to me an indication of just how disappointed and upset and frustrated the Galaxy were. But um, So while there's this gnashing of teeth and, and, and real concern about the Galaxy situation, let me say when the Galaxy went into the seven-game stretch that started with Portland, so this was after El Trafico won, they played Portland, Atlanta, DC United, Dallas, Seattle, LAFC, and then Seattle again. If you remember, we talked on the show, and I said that was a really tough stretch. And I, I predicted the Galaxy would get four points out of that stretch. Yeah, how, how four they points do? Out of seven, they got five, Ooh. but they've only won one of their last seven. So you look at that and you say, okay, five points in seven games, won one of their last seven, that's bad. It's not good, but when you look at what's coming up, and this is what I was talking about then. I, I said when they went into that stretch, I thought they'd get four points, and I still thought they'd make the playoffs comfortably because they – Coming up, they have a stretch now. They finish the season three games at home, three on the road. They play Colorado, Sporting Kansas City, Montreal, RSL, Vancouver, and Houston. How have they done against those teams? Well, Colorado, they've struggled. Yeah. Um, but uh, Sporting Kansas City, they lost one of their last three against Sporting Kansas City. They won against Montreal last year. Um, they've won two of their last three against RSL. They haven't lost to Vancouver in the last two years. Houston, a little difficult. If you remember, Houston – um, Houston's beat them once this year and then knocked the Galaxy out of the playoffs. Excuse me, the Galaxy beat Houston this year, but uh, Houston swept them last year and knocked the Galaxy out of the playoffs. So I think the Galaxy are looking pretty good going into this home stretch. It, there's a little bit of a musical chairs situation right now. The Galaxy have the last playoff berth. They're seventh in the league. There are uh, seven teams separated by just six points. If you want to go back to Sporting Kansas City, they're still technically in there, I guess. So that would make, uh, a, what would that be, eight teams separated by six points. Um, definitely a musical chair situation. Only uh, you know, only six teams after LAFC are going to qualify for playoff first. So it's going to be tough. But I, I really like the way the Galaxy finished the season with that schedule. I think that they're going to get in there. That, that's why I said that there, there really isn't any panic here. And, and I don't think you can sit there and... 
and claim that there is panic either. Whenever you're looking at the uh, at the LA Galaxy and, and and what they have coming up, you're right. Um, this game, and, and I saw so many people. They said because of the results around the league. And listen, all the results that came this weekend went against the Galaxy. Everything that could have basically gone against the Galaxy did. I think down to every single game. Uh, and you knew there was a chance to recycle them all the way down to seventh at the end of this if everything went away. And the last sort of puzzle piece that happened was after the Galaxy's loss on Sunday, Sunday evening. Uh, uh, LAFC lost to Minnesota, the first loss at home for LAFC uh, this year, and that then jumped Minnesota over the LA Galaxy as well, and so that dropped them into seventh place. Now, it gets even worse because really there is a chance, um, and probably you know maybe a good chance, that Portland, who has, I think, all of their last remaining seven games, Kevin, at home, no, um, Portland has six of the last seven okay. at home. Six of the last seven at a home. Very tough schedule. They play a really tough schedule. You, you have to imagine they're not going to get all the points, but they're certainly going to get some points and probably more points than than maybe other teams. But and Port- they have a game in hand. And they have a game in hand, and that game comes up this weekend. The LA Galaxy don't play this weekend. Portland does. If Portland if Portland wins that game, uh, then you could see the LA Galaxy actually drop below the playoff line before they have a chance to come back on September 11th. Again, the next game for the LA Galaxy uh, off this weekend, but back in college. Colorado, Commerce City, Colorado, with uh, with the plague and everything. Um, they're in Colorado uh, playing against the Colorado Rapids, and we've talked about on the last Thursday show, uh, we talked about the international call-ups and what that could mean for the LA Galaxy. Five players gone. Some will be back for sure. Some probably won't, and it might be sort of a, a toss-up about whether they play. I would say it's not the worst-case scenario of, of I, I think Seattle might actually have 10 players, I think I heard on the broadcast, 10 players gone with an international duty uh, coming up here. So it's not worst-case scenario, but it's not a great scenario going into high altitude of Colorado and, and playing that. So uh, it's going to be a frantic finish. Remember, six games being played by the LA Galaxy in September. Uh, the Seattle game was the first one. They now have basically those 10 days off, uh, and they'll come back and play against the Colorado Rapids. But uh, this was never a must-win game, but it looks bad currently. As a matter of fact, the LA Galaxy dropping to 7th in the Western Conference is just one place below their lowest uh, that I've been able to keep track of. They were at uh, at in eighth place in the Western Conference, I think the second or third week of the season, so very early uh, in that season, and, and certainly um, something that uh, that it will, will make Galaxy fans, I think, feel a little uneasy, and I think they're going to feel uneasy for two reasons, Kevin. One is because it never feels good to be below that red playoff line, um, and two is the performance in Seattle just was was it was entertaining it was it showed good fight but the fact it came up short um really has to sing, I, I think mentally harm them more than anything else and seeing themselves possibly drop below that red line also sort of mental harm there instead of you know, you know the physical part of this but the galaxy had a bunch of chances really to to steal a point in Seattle and it would have been a stolen point i mean um, I thought that they played well enough to get the point, and certainly with uh, with Jorgen Shelvik, who we'll talk about here in a second, scoring a goal. Why not get a point out of that game? You know, another three three game for the Galaxy, um, but it didn't go that way, and and that in my mind hurts them. Well, I, I think what hurts them maybe even more, and and the fact that they have ten days to think about this. I mean, you you have to look at the mental side of the picture this late in the season when everyone's exhausted. The Galaxy rallied. They were down two nothing. They came back. They tied the game. They fought, uh, you know, in a place that's difficult to play. Seattle's only lost two two home games this year. It's a very difficult place to play on the turf, 46,000 people. So the Galaxy fight back to tie the game. They think they're going to get a point, uh, and then they give it away, and they come back to probably one of the, the their more valiant performances of the season, at least recently, and they get nothing for it. Uh, you know, a couple of things that kind of trouble me about where the Galaxy are. After two months, when they went into May, they had 22 points. They have 20 points since then. Um, It used to be that whenever Zlatan decided he was going to play and take over a game, he did that in the Galaxy 1. Zlatan has scored in four straight games. He scored seven goals in the last four games. The Galaxy has only won one of those. Um, And and the the fifth game in that streak, which which they lost, he had 15 shots. So they... He scores in four straight games. The fifth game in that streak, he gets 15 shots and they lose. So one of those five games they've won when when Zlatan's really been on fire. Um, this is the fourth time it's that he's since he's been in MLS that he's scored in four straight games. Um, the Galaxy have only lost one of those games. In the previous 13, the Galaxy have only lost one of those games. So, um, it, you know, now it's to the point where even Zlatan, can't take over the game like he used to and can't uh you know you have to go back to lafc 
the game at uh, well, there was the game at uh, Bank of California where he had a couple goals, but really the game I think the last game that he really dominated was the game at uh, at Stub Up Center at Dignity Hill Sports Park. Yeah. Um, so uh, the point is, it used to be that whenever Zalatan decided he was going to play, he took over the game and the Galaxy won. And there was no stopping them. Now that doesn't even seem to work. That doesn't seem to be a formula anymore. Well, two things. Uh, let's focus on Zlatan Ibrahimovic in this Seattle game. Uh, one is that he got another goal, as you said. That makes now 23 goals in 23 games played. Uh, 2,070 minutes on the season in 2019. Zlatan Ibrahimovic now sits alone in second place of the LA Galaxy's single season scoring record. He is one goal behind uh, 2002's Carlos Ruiz, who had 24 goals in 26 games played in 2,376 minutes. Carlos Ruiz averaging 0.92 goals a game or one goal every 99 minutes. Zlatan Ibrahimovic in 2019, 23 goals, 23 games played, averaging one game, one goal per game, funny how that works, and one goal every 90 minutes. Uh, those currently stay synced up as we talked about so um you know what you've seen from Zlatan Ibrahimovic over last season and and he surpassed his scoring from last season um but what you've seen from him in this season as well is is sort of an exercise at least in my mind Kevin it's an exercise in, in a man who is dragging this team forward as much as he possibly can um you know I think on Thursday night Eric and I were trying to put into perspective what Zlatan Ibrahimovic has meant to this LA Galaxy team in 2018 and 2019 and I'm not so sure that you can easily quantify it um he will go down as an la galaxy legend because of what he was able to do and even if it's just two seasons um and the amount of goals he scored and he may not get anything for that which is sort of going to be uh you know up to the rest of the team uh and guillermo barrescoloto hopefully to uh to empower the rest of the team to get zlatan something out of this time whether or not this is his last year or not i think right now there's even some possibilities that you could see him back next year um, but what he's been able to do, the 23 goals in 23 games played um, this season, uh, and, and again, averaging one goal per game and one goal every 90 minutes is, is an unbelievable feat when you look at you know Carlos Ruiz, uh, Eduardo Hurtado, Robbie Keane, Landon Donovan. Um, you know, these are the guys who, who sit atop the LA Galaxy single season goal scoring record. Um, and now Zlatan Ibrahimovic is in second. And you would imagine that he's going to beat this single season record and he's going to pass Carlos Ruiz. And that, that puts him up on a pretty, you know, pretty tall pyramid in terms of LA Galaxy players. No, there's, he's definitely going to score uh, more goals this season, more than one, most likely. Um, it, when you look at how much he's dominated the offense, though, and we go back and forth whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, he has, as you mentioned, uh, the number of goals he has, um, the rest of the team only has 18. He has 23. The rest of the team has 18. He has 117 shots. That's second in the league to Carlos Vela. The rest of the team has 245 combined. He has 47 shots on goal. Also second in the league. The rest of the team has 48 combined. Um, he also leads the league in go game winning goals. Um, it, it's been a, a dominant performance, but you know, I still wonder if he would benefit from maybe uh, some other attacking options that might take a little bit of the heat off him. But but he really does like to draw that onto himself, and it's not like um, um, it seems to be slowing him down anymore. But I just wonder if the Galaxy would be more effective if they had somebody up there that could share some of that offense. Well, well they, but they do now, and you've seen it. You've seen the danger that Christian Pavone has been able to pro provide. And even if he's not scoring, he was dangerous enough in the Seattle team, in the Seattle game, that they had to cover. I mean, you've seen Zlatan uptick sort of in his effectiveness uh, again since Pavone has come uh, come on. Um, and in this particular game, you got goals from you know Zlatan, which is fine. That's good. It's and it was a good header. Um, and I want to talk about sort of his effort based and, and how Zlatan runs. But uh, you know, Zlatan got a goal. You got um, Oriel Antuna gets a goal, and you get Jorgen Shelvik in a goal. I mean, this should have been the game where the Galaxy picked up Zlatan Ibrahimovic, who looked exhausted through most of this game until he scored the goal. Um, it, this should have been the game that really you had that offensive support, and Pavone had many good looks that also was taking the heat off as Laton Ibrahimovic. So you're seeing that now. I would argue at the beginning of the you know the 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 season um, with Zlatan, it was a one man show, and we saw that. And I think your comment you know rings true. But now 
um, with Pavone out there, with Fabio Alvarez, who I don't think had a great game in Seattle, and I'm not so sure that the turf didn't just totally work over Pavone and, and Ibrahimovic. You can see that they're not comfortable on it. Um, and, and quite honestly, I think Julian Araujo would also agree the turf uh, certainly had some effect on the game for him as well. But um, you look at this and, and you're seeing that offensive sort of uh, you know attacking group increase. And if slash when um, you know Roman Alessandrini comes back, that's another uh, sort of piece to that puzzle as well. So I think there's options to grow that, but you're gonna give it to the guy who's you know six foot five and scores pretty much at will. I mean, you saw him score the goal that sort of got the LA Galaxy back into it. Um, somebody tweeted out, Kevin, and I think you and I will agree that this is an active. Um, or, or, or an accurate, I should say, an accurate sort of portrayal of Zlatan Ibrahimovic, which is uh, Zlatan is the most energy-efficient striker I've ever watched. I forget who put it out there, but he's the most energy-efficient striker I've ever watched. Um, to me, Kevin, you and I watched during the game, and you know, if you don't get to watch the games in person all the time, um, you, you miss this, but Zlatan doesn't do a lot of running, and everybody knows that. Um, but when he needs to, and when he does, he kicks it into gear and is able to do it. He scores that goal, you know, that comes off really the back of his head and he beats Stefan Fry and that, that puts the LA Galaxy all suddenly back into the game in the second half. Um, you're seeing the uptick in energy. All of a sudden it was like, okay, now it's time to start playing. Now it's time to start to do that. And he is energy efficient. He's also old and he needs to be energy efficient. And certainly the turf, I think, in the back of his mind, Kevin is is still sort of, you know, the turf monster is out there looking for Zlatan Ibrahimovic and he's very much aware of it and he plays much more cautiously on turf uh, than he does on grass. I, I would argue that the there are a, a couple of more forwards who are more energy efficient. I saw Mario Balotelli uh, score two goals this year in Marseille back in February. He hadn't even broken a sweat. <laughs> he didn't break a sweat in the entire game and had two goals. He basically just stands in front of the net and if a ball bounces off the post, he knocks it in and picks up a goal. It's, it's pretty incredible how he winds up being in the right place at the right time without ever bothering to run. Um, I watched Cristiano Ronaldo in the 2018 World Cup, too. I, I focused on him. He does very little running. Uh, when he does take off, he's pretty fast, but that's because everybody else has been running for 90 minutes and right. he's been standing around. Um, so, yeah, but, I mean, that's what makes the good guys good is they know when to be there. They know when to use their energy. They know when to uh, conserve it, and that's why you see guys – like Zlatan at 38 is able to occasionally blow past people. It's because he's conserved his energy, and it's not you know it's not really uh, a, a, a criticism. It's just an observation that he does conserve his energy. You know, um, you can call it lazy if you want, but it seems to work. He has over 500 career goals, so it seems to be working. I, I think the Galaxy really do catch a break having the 10 days off between games because they are coming off the turf. A couple of guys, like you said, Pavone, new to the turf, and Tuna probably hasn't played a lot on turf. Um, uh, and uh, obviously Zlatan not having, uh, not wanting to play and not liking to play on turf. It, it'll take three or four days for them to get their legs back. So it's a good thing that they, that they do have some time off. You know, two of the last six games I do have at altitude, and that's going to be a problem going into Colorado. Um, if, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think Zlatan has played there yet, correct? He missed the one game because, um, he was the suspension, suspension. Yeah. right? Yeah, Last I think what, year, what, so he hasn't played there yet. Was that the All Star suspension that he missed? I think yes, it was, yeah. yeah, it was right after the All Star game. They went there and they lost. So, so Lotton has not played at Colorado yet. Um, that will be. I, I think that's going to be a little bit difficult for him. So, but so the break again is is very very important for him. He's going to need that break. It'd be nice to see whether Allison Drini will be able to come back by Colorado. It's probably a little bit too early, but with Legit likely out for that game and. And Tuna and Dos Santos both out as well. Right. Um, it'd be nice to have a little bit more midfield depth there. Yeah. It. it by the way, I, I will just preface this. I, I agree with you. I think those guys will probably miss some of the miss some of that game. I'm not sure they're going to miss all of that game. I know they play the night before, but there's still something in me that tells me that Greg Berhalter is smart enough to sort of say, okay, which guys are you know have a game tomorrow, that type of thing, and we'll see if you know Sebastian Legette maybe plays the first game and then you know has a sub role in the second game and can still make the trip and and down to Colorado in order to play in Colorado. Not saying he starts. Um, but he, he still may be involved. And that goes for almost every player. I think, um, you know, Giancarlo Gonzalez definitely looks like he'll be back. Um, I think Rolf Felcher probably, I think, he did they play in Miami? I wanted to say that they played in Florida somewhere. Um, so there's a bunch of guys. A bunch of these games aren't actually outside of the United States. 
um, which which helps I think in that recovery process. But that the Seattle or the Colorado game on the September 11th, it looks like the Galaxy will be shorthanded in terms of international players, and so that's going to be um, sort of a, a, an interesting one to keep an eye on. Let, let me say something about that because I actually talked to Greg Burhalter last week about this. Um, and when you, you're right, when you look at uh, the U.S. will be playing its game on the 10th, and again the Galaxy play on the 11th in Colorado. That game was originally scheduled, I believe, on the 12th. Yeah, I think I think that's might what have, you said. Yeah, yeah, I think that that actually might have helped. I mean, it would have been tough coming back uh, to play that home game in Sporting Kansas City a couple of days later. But given the international break, it might have helped them. But it it still may not be too bad of a bad of a problem. Even if Sebastian Legette is still with the national team, they play in St. Louis. That's a very quick flight from St. Louis right. to to Denver. So he could easily be there. Uh, the Mexican guys, Dos Santos and Ariel Antuna, they'll be in uh, San Antonio, uh, same time zone, uh, right? Correct. You, you're a Colorado boy. Yes. Same time zone, yes. Texas. Yes. That should be an easy flight. Um, they shouldn't have a problem there. Um, so it is possible for those guys to get there. If they play uh, in the game, they might not be able to play a full game for the Galaxy. They might not play at all. They might just be a substitute uh, in case there's you know, a need. But it's possible. In talking to Greg Berhalter, who was a Galaxy assistant coach and then coached, it was the manager in Columbus for a number of years. He understands what MLS teams are going through. And he actually uh, acted affirmatively and left three Toronto players off his call-up list. He didn't call up uh, Michael Bradley, Josie Altidore, or Omar Gonzalez because he said that it, Toronto was in a tough spot. They were in a playoff race and they would have two games during the break. And he left those guys off. That immediately led to calls of, wait a minute, are you acting in, you know, are you acting uh, affirmatively in favor of Toronto? Are you trying to put your thumb on the scale in the playoff race? And his response was, no, no, not at all. What he, first of all, he puts the blame squarely on MLS, which is really where it belongs. Right. No other team and no other major league in the world plays during an international break. And even if he were to say, uh, say, I'm not calling up any MLS players, which is unreasonable. But if you were to say that, that doesn't prevent Costa Rica from calling up Giancarlo Gonzalez. It right. doesn't prevent Venezuela from calling up Ralph Felcher or Mexico from calling up its players. So he he can only have a little bit of an effect. And in speaking specifically about Sebastian Legette, he said, look, Sebastian Legette is an important part of this player pool. We did not get to see him in the Gold Cup because he was injured. He said, um, in, in, he told me in Sebastian's case, he missed out on the Gold Cup, and that was a big chunk of time with the team. We want to get him back into the team. It's important if he wants to continue to make an impact with the national team. So he understands that he's going to be missing a game. I could definitely – I think you're right. I, he may uh, – it's a two-game international break. He's got 26 players. You would think that he'd play – uh, a number of players in the first game against Mexico, and then those guys that play might not play in the second game. I think if he looks at that, he might say, look, Sebastian Leggett, you're going to play against Mexico. Then you can you don't have to play against Uruguay. You can go back to the team. Or at the very least, come with us to St. Louis in case there's a need. You're close enough to Colorado. It'll be okay. I, I definitely I think he's going to take some of that into consideration. But another thing that Greg Berhalter said is, look, um, we only get – four international windows a year and then the, in this year this year there was the gold cup but he said we're in a difficult position because we're only allowed to play at certain times of the year and he said one thing i've been a little disappointed in is mls teams opting to play in the windows because it's infringing on the limited time we have with our players and he's absolutely right and the fact that as you mentioned seattle missing a ton of players that the mls pennant race that we've been you know playoff chase that we've been following all year could be dictated by the fact that Venezuela called up somebody right. or uh, Uruguay called up a U18 player or a U20 player, which has in, happened in the case of Brian Rodriguez, that that could affect the playoff chase. I mean, that seems really unfair. It, yeah, it does seem unfair. Um, and, and again, it, you know, it's Greg Berhalter, and I think he was correct in his wording, too, because I remember seeing this as well, which was, you know, that MLS teams choose to play during the internet. There is some flexibility with MLS teams and whether or not they want to play within these windows. Uh, a lot of times you can reschedule a game so that way it's outside of the window. The problem here is that, Kevin, if you don't play during this window, uh, you're going to have a more condensed schedule, and it's already six games in September plus one at the beginning of October. You have you know these seven games, basically, and I was talking to one player, and he's like, yeah, it's five weeks, and we have seven games. Um, he's like, it's the last five weeks of the season that was, you know, starting with Seattle. Uh, if you go back and look at this, the Galaxy now have 10 days off, which sounds great. And it is coming off of that turf game. You're right, Kevin. Uh, you know, sort of how that sits. But it's also not great because 
it, it really pushes everything together. It was already going to be pushed together, but it's really getting pushed together because now you go Wednesday, September 11th, Sunday, September 15th, Saturday, September 21st, Wednesday, September 25th, Sunday, September 29th, and Sunday, October 6th. I mean, so midweek, weekend, weekend, midweek, weekend, weekend. Um, that's how quickly these games are going to come. And with the international break in there, that adds possibly another two games to some of those legs uh, for the LA Galaxy and, and, you know, other teams. It's it's tough. You couldn't condense the schedule anymore. And, you know, MLS was trying to fix the playoff issue. And the playoff issue was that there was an international break in the playoffs, um, and it was ruining the momentum of the playoffs. There would be, you know, a two-week break basically in the middle of the playoffs, and all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, hey, MLS soccer's still going on? That's fun. Um, you know, all that thing. And I think that they did that, but in doing that, they've hurt – all these MLS teams, you see it. Um, and one of the reasons, <laughs> I think uh, John Strong said, one of the reasons that, um, you know, he called the Western Conference this gelatinous cube, um, sort of everything just forming and moving on the Western Conference. That's the Western Conference right now. It's any team can be in second place. Any team can be in eighth place right now. All it takes is one result, and you get shifted and, and, and shifted sideways. That's what happened to the LA Galaxy. They lost a game. They didn't pick up three points. They didn't pick up any points. And because of that, they got shuffled to the back of the line. The results went against them and now they have to struggle through this. But they have 10 days off, which is either good or bad. I think it's both. Uh, mentally, it's bad. Uh, physically, it's probably good. And now you look at this schedule, and this schedule is out of its mind crazy. By the way, had the LA Galaxy won the League's Cup game against Cruz Azul, they would have been playing on the 19th or 18th of September? If 18th, I, I believe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you would have had a game on the 15th against uh, at home against Sporting Kansas City, and you have a game at home against Montreal on Saturday, September 21st, and you would have thrown a game in between there, so there would have been seven games uh, in the month of September. I mean, that's one of the reasons that, uh, you know, from the very beginning, I, I think everybody was sort of leaning towards the LA Galaxy just getting eliminated out of that tournament being done with it. Well, and, and people are going to say, well, wait a minute, you know, they're playing Romney and they're playing, and you know, guys who aren't going to play for the first team, yes. But the coaching staff has to prepare for Cruz Azul if they had had that game. The coaching staff would have had to prepare for that game. It would have been a road trip. Teams would have, Players would have had to travel. Some guys who weren't going to play would have had to travel anyways just to, to, to give the team a full bench. It would have disrupted the, the training schedule for the first team guys. The Galaxy were very, very uh, – uh, what's the word? I know, it's, they're it's they're not very, very fortunate. happy that they, yeah. they don't have to play that game. Yeah. Um, you know, another thing that the, the international breaks do by the Gal by MLS deciding to play, uh, you know, the, the schedule that it does is – so, yeah, there is a – the break isn't as bad as – past years in the playoffs you're right uh, I remember it used to be so bad that as you said people would forget the playoffs were even going on and you'd have the conference semifinals and then there'd be this long break and the conference finals would come back and people would say wait a minute is this a rerun I thought these these playoff games were over one of the things is you talk about that compact schedule with a game every couple of days then the season ends on October 16th and if you make the playoffs and you play in the first round you have a 12-day break so you you're the players bodies are in this rhythm they're used to playing you know a couple times a week maybe um and then all of a sudden they got a 12-day break you can say well if you have some bumps and bruises that's pretty good you can heal but there also is that um you know your body is used to going out there and playing every couple of days you see this with baseball teams that have long breaks in the playoffs how they they finally come back from the break and they're just not the same team so that 12-day break it's going to be interesting to see how teams come out of that and if you're if you're the first seed in each league, in this case would be Philadelphia and LAFC, they have an even longer break because they don't play the first round. They'll have a 15 or 16 day break depending on how the schedule falls. That's an awful long time to play 34 games, you know, in six months playing. Uh, what is it? I think it averages out to a game every six days, and then all of a sudden you're going to have 15 days off. That that's going to be tough, despite the fact you want to heal from some of those injuries. Certainly is. Uh, certainly is. Let's go quickly over just some of the highlights from, from this Seattle game, just in terms of uh, uh, just some things that I think made a huge difference. And, and I'll start with the starting lineup, and, and really you focus on the back line. Uh, Dan Starez, again, left out of the starting lineup. Um, this was, and I checked with the LA Galaxy, a coaching decision. So there is no injury, apparently, according according to uh, the LA Galaxy, at least not one that they made me aware of. Um, so, there's, uh, so Daniel Starez does not start. 
Again, we talked about Dan Stairs, you know, uh, being suspended for the last game, uh, and then I expected him to come back in here and do this. Uh, I think in this particular game, uh, it's it's a little bit of a toss up for me in terms of how much of how much that affected the game. But in my mind, it affected the game. I thought that uh, that Gonzalez had probably his worst game as an LA Galaxy player. Um, the the first half just throw away. It's a trash from both sides. I know Seattle ends up scoring late into injury time, and, and that certainly affects the way the second half then gets played out. Um, but you look at this, and, and People Gonzalez was was horrendous on this night. Um, this was one of the worst showings on the LA Galaxy field, and it's out of character for him. But I also wonder, him and Polenta don't play together that often. Gonzalez and Steras have been the sort of the, those those two um, sort of uh, partners in the back on center back, and moving Polenta out to the left um, doesn't hurt the LA Galaxy in my mind, although certainly Jorgen Shelvick, as we talked about, scores a goal, his first goal for the LA Galaxy. I think it's his first goal in like three years as well. So he did all of that stuff. I, I think Shelvick had an okay night. Uh, certainly some back post coverage issues from both him and Felcher. I thought Felcher had a good ta- good game on the attacking side and a poor game on the back side. There's no defensive person in this that I'm going to tell you, you know, escaped uh, unscathed from this particular game. Um, I did find out, though, if you listen to the uh, to the broadcast, Kevin, uh, John Strong was talking about there's a stat for goalkeepers, and basically it's like the opposite of expected goals, right? Um, so whenever you say, oh, from this position, the chances of you scoring a goal, that's basically what expected goals are. And so you would say, and they can calculate this, you know, after a game that the Galaxy had an expected goals of, you know, 2.7, which means they should have scored about 2.7 goals in this game from the positions that they shot from. And then you could look up at the they score. They overperformed. Yeah, you could say, oh, they overperformed or they underperformed or blah, blah, blah. You could see that's sort of what expected goals. Well, there's an opposite one for goalkeepers. And basically it's how many from the, from the, high percentage chances that teams are getting shots from how many goals does a goalkeeper save right so it's not talking about the shots that are like dribbled in and and Dave Bingham has to just pick it up off the ground these are talking about high percentage shots that probably should have gone in the goal and that were stopped and David Bingham leads all major leagues major league soccer goalkeepers in that stat and has saved 10 goals this season according to that stat so there's this argument about whether or not David Bingham is good or whether David Bingham is bad Uh, certainly I think he gets hung out by the defense a whole bunch I'm not going to say he's a great goalkeeper. I think he's average to above average. But when you look at this, without David Bingham, the LA Galaxy would have conceded 10 more goals is basically what that stat is trying to tell you, and that nobody else in the league has reached that those heights. So one, well, it, in, in my mind, it tells me that the defense is porous because they're giving up all these chances. But two, that David Bingham has been very solid this year. Well, I, even more to the point, if David Bingham wasn't there, they'd give up a lot of goals because there'd be nobody in front of the net. Um, oh, but um. Tch- I was going to say, I was if I was quick enough, I would have just, you know, launched the air horn. There it goes. There we go. Okay, good. Yes. Good. But, I mean, you, you, you make some really valid points. He's been an okay goalkeeper, but you can make the argument he's been really, really good. Uh, he's faced 162 shots. That's most in the league by, by a substantial margin. He's made 118 saves. That, again, is most in the league. His save percentage is 72.8. Only three goalkeepers in the league are better. So he's fourth best in the league in save percentage. And that's really a key stat because it's not like you say that the defense has been porous. He's faced a lot of shots. That's made it very difficult for him. But of the shots he faces, which ones does he turn does he turn away? If a, if a defense is great and they only give up one shot, but the goalkeeper doesn't stop it, they can still lose the game one to nothing, right? So save percentage is very important. His goals against average, 1.61, that's where it kind of gets a little bit dicey. That's about in the top third that's where it starts to get a little bit more closer to average. Um, 1.62, that's a lot of goals a game. But when you're facing 162 shots, yeah, that's not so bad. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think you can you can make the argument either way. David Bingham is the greatest goalkeeper, uh, you know, since Brad Gusan, or David Bingham is really struggling. But what the truth is, he's been having to deal with it, living in a shooting gallery all year. Um, so I, I think I think he's probably performed better than. Uh, he should have been expected to, and he's kept the Galaxy in a lot of games. Well, the other thing uh, we, we can sort of look at, and I've been projecting these and, and sort of where they stand is, you know, how much better or how much worse is this LA Galaxy defense than it was last year? And you try to project these things, and basically I can do a simple, you know, projection of, of how many goals they've scored and how many goals they've given up and project that over 34 games to sort of give you an idea and compare that to what happened last season. So in 2018, the LA Galaxy, again, gave up 66 or scored 66 goals. 
Uh, defensive, they allowed 64 goals, so a plus two differential in 2018. What you have right now in the LA Galaxy is that they've scored 41 goals to date. They've conceded 45 goals, all right, through 28 games. If we look at our 34 game projected goals allowed and goals scored, uh, goals scored 49.8, so 50 goals right now is what the LA Galaxy are projected to score through 34 games, um, and that gives them, you know, uh, 16 less goals than last year, uh, if you want to round that up to 50, right? So that, okay, so you're like, okay, the offense hasn't scored enough, but what about the defense? Last year, again, the defense gave up 64 goals. If you want to round up right now, they're projected in 34 games to give up 55 goals. Uh, so they would be about nine goals better. Not a significant increase. Uh, certainly at the beginning of the year, they were one of, uh, I think through about six or seven games, the LA Galaxy had one of the top-rated defenses in Major League Soccer, and that goals projected was was way down low in like the 30 goals range. Um Whenever you looked at it, that's not what it has certainly trended to be in giving up four goals and three goals in back-to-back games, so seven goals in two games um, certainly hurts that. But again, there has been some improvement. I don't think it's enough, obviously, and I think the most Galaxy fans just said, went, duh. Um, it's not enough, but it is an improvement. This Galaxy defense is, I would say, significantly better than last year's defense. However, there was a lot of room for improvement in there, over there. So even if you're looking at, you know, a nine-goal difference, um, you know, I, I don't know that that makes anybody feel warm and fuzzy about the Galaxy's defense. And, and make no doubt about it, at least in my mind, Kevin, uh, make no doubt about it that the LA Galaxy defense let down the LA Galaxy on, on Sunday afternoon. Um, the, the offense scored. Jorgen Shelvick scored. Uriel Antuna scored. Zlatan Ibrahimovic scored. Uh, Christian Pavone was pretty active. I thought Fabio Alvarez was quiet, uh, but Joe Corona came in and actually had a great performance uh, in terms of coming in and doing it. The, 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 everything here sort of leads to, in my mind, and I think if you listen and read Guillermo Barrascolotto's uh, quotes, Kevin, he said that it was an even game and they probably should have deserved a draw in that. But unfortunately, a sub that he made and probably a smart sub. I don't even question the sub. Maybe the timing of it may be anything else, but a sub they made really ended up costing the LA Galaxy the def- uh, LA Galaxy the draw. Um, and maybe whether that's fair or not, that's where you sort of have to, to to lay this at. One, at the hands of the defense, and two, at this particular play, which was bringing Julian Araujo in in the 89th minute, Kevin. Uh, he comes in, and immediately the ball gets sort of tossed in his general direction by Seattle. Uh, Araujo does a great job, steps up into the into the gap there and takes the ball and then slips. And when he slips, Kevin, uh, he takes himself out of the play. Basically, he can't track the runner. He, gets, uh, he has to track Brad Smith because Jordan Moore's got the ball, I think, into Smith, and then Smith laid a cross away. I'll say this for Araujo. He did get a foot on it. It, and he did redirect it. Unfortunately, he redirected it right to Rodon. I think if Araujo's foot doesn't get the redirect on it, this ball was actually looking to be cut back um, into the center instead of played all the way across to uh, Rodon, who gets his brace at the back post. And again, you have to ask, uh, where was Jorgen Shelvik on that? Did he step forward as soon as he saw Araujo get the ball, as probably he should have in order to break out and try to try to release some pressure? Uh, was he too slow in getting back? Did he not track the runner? Uh, there were so many tracking runner issues in this particular game. That's why you have to lay it at the hands of the defense there's just in my mind uh there's no way to get around that well you mentioned Giancarlo Gonzalez and he is a uh, you know a world cup player he's a national team player from Costa Rica you mentioned that he had a a rather dismal game he was one of the guys that uh Guillermo really wanted to bring in they they worked very, very hard to get him there this year but I was just looking when you were talking about how the defense is sort of um, um, not performed up to capabilities and struggled a little bit. And they may be better than last year, but they have struggled. When you look at the fact that the Galaxy got off to that fast start, and as we talked about, 22 points to their first nine games, I believe it was, through the end of April, um, and, and they were playing so well. And Giancarlo Gonzalez got his first start uh, on May 11th. That was the, He played off the bench in a couple of games. But up until May 11th, they had, uh, when you look at the goals that they allowed, one zero two. One, zero, the shutout again. Uh, one, another shutout, one goal. And then he comes in on May 11th. And after that, that's where the Galaxy sort of started to struggle. When you look at the number of games they won, the number of points that they've you know, accumulated. I'm not saying it's all Giancarlo Gonzalez's fault, but I'm just saying it seemed as if something changed about that time. Whether it was uh, they, they played a... a, a minor, they made some minor tactical differences with Giancarlo Gonzalez, the way they wanted to push forward from the back line, play out of the back, whether it was a tactical thing, whether, you know, Giancarlo Gonzalez didn't fit in well with some of his teammates at first. I don't know what it was, but I'm just saying that there does seem to be uh, um, a correlation between 
when he started uh, and when the galaxy started to struggle. Yeah, it's it's and that's I, I, I you're absolutely right. If you go back and look at the stats on that, here's the problem with it. Right. Here's the, here's trying to quantify that in, in any sort of means is that uh, for the most part, outside of Dan Starez, Giancarlo Gonzalez has been one of the most consistent L.A. Galaxy defenders. And so you sit there and your eyes tell you it hasn't been his fault. And um, I actually got a, a, a tweet from uh, a guy named uh, Josh. Hey, good name, Josh. Awesome. Uh, anyway, Josh tweeted it and he says, um, he, he says, I don't believe Polenta or Gonzalez are bad defenders. I also think there's decent depth at the center back position. The fullbacks are just subpar defensively at best. Am I wrong? Is there something I'm missing? I mean, if you're looking at the weak link in most of these games, it has been probably Felcher and it has been Shelvick. Uh, my argument against just completely pinning everything on them is that Guillermo Barrescoloto requires both of those guys to play offense. Um, they are an offensive tool. Uh, both Felcher getting forward, putting crosses in, and you saw you know, some good left-footed crosses, and I made a joke, hey, left-footed crosses and Felcher shouldn't be a thing. But um, he actually played he had played some good ones in, but even from the cutting inside and hitting it with his left foot, uh, going down the line and playing with his right foot. I, again, on the offensive side, Jordan Shelvitz scored a freaking goal, Kevin. I mean, you know, the, the any, anybody who predicted that one, you know, just made a million dollars in Vegas. Um, but, it, you know, those are good things, but... It, it hurts the LA Galaxy defense that those guys constantly get in there. And then it's guys like Jonathan Dos Santos and Sebastian Legette as of late that have needed to pick up the slack in the middle in order to cover for those guys. Now, I think that, you know, putting Dan Steras back there and starting him in this game would have been what I would have done because then you could have had Polenta outside um, and it gives you a, a better defensive shape. I think the Galaxy sometimes get caught up in the, you know, go forward and score and score everything. And Guillermo Berescoloto has said, you know, I don't play for draws, I play for wins. But that hurts. Um, and that put the LA Galaxy down 2 to nothing in this one because they didn't have a very solid defensive core. Although they controlled most of the first half. I mean, listen, I say throw the first half of soccer out. It was not pretty. It was not worth watching. Um, the commentators, and I agree with both Stu Holden and John Strong, were saying, you know, this isn't what we paid for in, in terms of we thought there was going to be a high score. It just took a, uh, a half for everybody to work that out of their system. And then really, you know, the goals started coming and everything started flying forward. I, I think the Galaxy, it, it, in order to learn from this and get better from this, have to take the positives away and they have to throw out the negatives. But, you know, Joe Corona said afterwards, you know, we need to sit down and we need to figure out what we're doing defensively that's allowing these issues because uh, Christian Roldan was wide open twice on the night um, and probably once Felcher's problem, probably once uh, Shelvick's problem um, and Polenta and Gonzalez, uh, you know, those it's all a defensive unit back there. Um, so this game hurts them mentally, as we said. Um, they have to take the positives out of this and they have to look at saying that they can beat Colorado. But, Kevin... What did we see that's sort of been consistent from the LAFC game and the Seattle game is that it looks like, you know, the 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 conditioning or the exhaustion that these guys are feeling is affecting all aspects um, of these games. And so now you wonder what they're going to be able to do in the thin air of Colorado. Well, and, and when we talk about the mental part of it, where you said that the long break, the, the reason the long break affects them is they have 10 days to think about this. And it, it, this is where it's going to be really contingent on the coaching staff to point out that, look, you guys came back from a 2 nothing deficit in a tough place. This, it, you know, it, yes, we fell short at the end and we didn't get a point, but this was a great performance. And, and you guys really showed a lot of heart and character. And this is what you need to reflect on. I, I guarantee you every one of those players wants to get out there and play a game right now just to prove, to, you know, th that this was a fluke, that they shouldn't have given up the – the point or even three points. So, uh, you know, the players when I got out there and play, but it's up to the coaching staff to say, look, this was a good effort. It didn't end the way we wanted it to. And the fact that a lot of players didn't speak to the media afterwards um, shows their frustration. Um, so it's, again, continuing on the coaching staff to point out that this was a good effort. When you look at statistically, you know, the Galaxy had the ball 60% of the time. Yep. Uh, they outshot Seattle 16 to 11. They had nine shots on target to six shots on goal for Seattle. And this was a Seattle home game. So uh, the, the statistics, everything but the scoreboard shows that this was a game that the Galaxy should have and actually did won. When you look at the individual battles, they just fell short on the scoreboard. But unfortunately, that's how they decide who gets three points and who gets none. Uh, Guillermo Barrescoloto said after the game, uh, I quote, I think the game was very even. We managed the ball but couldn't get very deep in the first half. In the second half, we finished better. Then Seattle scored again, but we fought and tied the game. They scored the third goal, and I think it was pretty clear it was offside. Uh, I don't know why the VAR didn't say anything, but we kept fighting and trying to tie the game. But in the last minute, we made a mistake, and they won the game. 
Um, that's that's an interesting point. Uh, it's the Jordan Morris goal uh, that comes to uh, sort of, again, uh, retake the lead for Seattle after the Galaxy had come back uh, for a second time to to tie this, or excuse me, for the first time to tie it up. Um, you had Uriel and Tuna score in the 75th minute. Jordan Morris scores in the 77th minute. Uh, here is the, here's the problem. Uh, everybody who watched the replay clearly sees that Raul Rui Diaz is offside whenever he receives the ball from Jordan Morris, and then that ball gets played through, and Morris basically walks in past the LA Galaxy defense uh, and scores a goal. That's great, um, except that, you know, for, for as well as I thought that this game was was officiated, which I thought Chris Penso was quick on the whistle. Um, he didn't allow a lot of contact, which is probably okay. I think the yellow cards, again, this uh, another early yellow card to an LA Galaxy player in the sixth minute um, when there's a similar foul, not more than probably 10 minutes later, that doesn't go get punished, you know, against Seattle for a yellow card, and that's one of the things the LA Galaxy certainly were upset about. Um, um, but you look at this, and and the v, VAR is there for a reason. Uh, this wasn't one of those things where you sit there and go, oh, it's too close. You can clearly see the lines on the field and where they are, and that Ru- Raul Ruiz Diaz is past Jorgen Shelvik. Uh, there's graphics up there that you can see it. It's a foot. It's a foot, maybe a foot and a half, where he's offside. That's not within the, or that's not outside of the range of clear and obvious. If I can see it quickly on the first replay and say, that looks offside, and then when they slow it down... Um, it, you you see it again. It's it's a failure of VAR, but it's not VAR's problem. Uh, this is again referees. The referees looking at the same image that we're all looking at, unless they have separate sideline cameras that they're not showing with us. Um, and and that one to me is pretty clearly offside. And because it's offside, that one should have called back. In fact, I tweeted out as soon as the ball went in, and we saw the first replay. I said this one's coming back. It's offside. It's pretty clear. Uh, and then there's nothing, and it, and it plays on. This is, you know, it's a trend that VAR is supposed to be in there to clean up these mistakes. And it seems like after sort of the hubbub of the Hawkeye system uh, being enacted over in, uh, in the English Premier League, which, by the way, I'm a big fan of, um, you know, using Hawkeye to tell whether or not you're offside uh, or not uh, sounds like a great thing to me. And whether it's one inch or a half inch or whatever it is, if you're offside, you're offside. There's really no gray area within that rule. Um, this is one where VAR missed it, and it hurts the LA Galaxy. Uh, unless somebody can show me an angle that I wasn't able to see. And by the way, uh, I'll say it again because I said it on Twitter. Uh, the games that are currently being broadcast by FS1, um, by the Fox Soccer, or however they're doing it, um, have been in the production phase of things pretty pretty horrible. Um, and whether or not it's the webcam that they seem to be using, the dial-up webcam that they seem to be using behind goal, or whether it was the long and protracted zoom into Stephen Fry while Seattle charged down the field uh, and almost scored on the LA Galaxy. Uh, I never saw it. I just heard the announcers talking about it, but there was about 30 seconds of just Stephen Fry walking on the field. Um, you know, the the quality of these things affects how people view these things. And right now, in my mind, what you're seeing from from that from the Fox side of things is is well below par, um, and I'm kind of surprised to be honest with you because I thought the bar was higher than that. Well, you and I talked quite a bit about offside before we started this broadcast, which just proves what kind of boring people we are. We had a long discussion about offside. That's right. Um, but you know, it, this was a big issue at the Women's World Cup too, and really the referees are are sort of beholden to the camera angles they have at the World Cup. I think there were, uh, you know countless cameras. I think they had 36 cameras per game. Um, Not so much in some of the games in MLS, and you can only use the camera angles you have. Um, One thing I noticed at the Women's World Cup is it seemed as if the referees knowing that every game, every play was going to be reshowed, you know, countless times on TV around the world, they were really hesitant to make any kind of call. They wanted everything to be backed up with VAR. They didn't want to be proven wrong. Um, and and I, it, it did affect the officiating. Some games you had, you know, several very long uh, VAR reviews because the referees, again, didn't want to be criticized after the fact. Um, it, 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 you know, it affected some games. It definitely affected the flow of the games. It made some of the games very difficult to watch because they were stopping every few minutes for VAR review. Um, the referees just were not confident to make those calls. I'm not saying that that's a problem in MLS, but there was one play in a game where the 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 – Goal score was not offside. There was not an offside call. But what they did at, at the Women's World Cup is they went back and looked at the entire sequence. And there was one play where uh, one team argued that the ball was actually across the sideline um, during the sequence, the buildup to the goal. 
And so they didn't contest the goal. They didn't contest an offside call on the goal, but they contested that the buildup, the ball had gone out of bounds, and therefore the sequence never should have happened. Uh, the officials reviewed eight different camera angles. On seven of those camera angles, it showed the ball was uh, clearly on the other side of the of the sideline, that the, the goal should have been disallowed. The last shot showed that it was right on the line. Therefore, it made it a good goal. And, and you talk about it has to be, you know, a clear, uh, clear, and uh, clear evidence. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I wonder sometimes about splitting the hair that closely. And is it, the official said at the World Cup, look, and, and you just said the same thing. If you're an inch offside or a mile offside, you're still offside. There is no, there is no, uh, you know, you know, parameter to look at. And say, well, it's just a little bit offside. It's okay. If you're offside, you're offside. But when you have to split the hair to, down to that degree, where seven photos show that it's uh, on the other side, but then you find one photo that that shows that it's not. And, and I say that only to 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 go back to the to the uh, available camera angles. If you can break it down that closely at a World Cup match, and then and then prove that the goal should count. You know, it, I would guess there would be some games in MLS where there are extra camera angles that that don't exist in every game. Maybe a goal that is important is disallowed simply because there was an extra camera there. I don't know. You say it, you say that but, there there was an actual, and I forget. I think it was last year. Um, the LA Galaxy scored a goal. Um, and the only reason this goal is allowed, I think ESPN was doing the game, and they have their goal line camera, the go the camera that actually fits inside of the the goal, um, and looks right across the line. So it's in the post of the goal and looks across the line. And the ball had gone over the line, but the referees didn't flag it. And nobody knew whether or not it was goal. And on the field, they called it not a goal. Um, and then it went on for a little bit, and the ball got kicked out of bounds, and they went back and actually looked at it, and they were able to pull up that camera angle that is only available when ESPN does those games, the goal line camera that looks down the goal line, and you could clearly see the ball had gone over the line, and that and that went in. So you're absolutely right. It is about available camera angles. I'll tell you right now, the EPL is doing it better than Major League Soccer, which shouldn't surprise you, um, but they're using actually the Hawkeye system, the same one that uses their goal line technology, to actually call the offside. And the offside happens really quickly because of that. The referees are able to key up the key frame, which is, you know, whenever that ball is played forward, they freeze it right there at that, and then they basically are able to draw in where the uh, furthest point of the attacking player is, and then Hawkeye can go in and be like, yeah, you're offside. Um, well, correct me on this because I'm probably wrong. But so Chris Panso is the is the center referee. He's on the field. He's running the the show on the field. The video assistant referee in the in the case of the game in Seattle was uh, Jose Carlos Rivero. Yep. So he's looking at the video. Chris Panso is trying to manage the game on the field. My understanding is that it is the responsibility of the video assistant referee in this case, Jose Carlos Rivero to call down to Chris Pencil and say, wait a minute, we got to take a look at this. Yep. I think there may be a problem. And then Chris Pencil goes over and says yes or no. If Carlos, uh, if Jose Carlos Rivero doesn't call down and say, look, I think there's something wrong with this. If he looks at it and says, no, the guy's on side, it's okay. Um, Chris Pencil may say, hey, how did that look? But I think the responsibility for a lot of this lies with the video assistant referee to say, I'm not sure about this. And if it's not reviewed, my understanding would be that the video assistant referee didn't think there was anything worth reviewing. Correct. That is absolutely correct. Now, here's the issue. Wow, I got yeah, it right. Yeah, no, you did. You did you did get it right. That's every cool. every goal is reviewed. So everybody's like, oh, it didn't get reviewed. No, it got reviewed. It just it wasn't suggested for any correction or an on field review. And remember that the the uh, the VAR tech can can call down to, you know, Jose. Jose can call down to Chris and say, hey, Chris, um, he's well offside. I can see it. This goal needs to be disallowed, and you, you should do it. And Penso can then see, say, do I need to look at it? And Jose can be like, no, 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 he's well offside. You're done. Raise the flag. Let's reset this, and let's go. Well, you know, no goal. And Penso can either take that advice, or he can say, you know what? I want to look at it just to make sure, and he can do that. Or, you know, they can call down and say, hey, Chris, this one's pretty tight. Um, it's, it's re in fact, it's real tight. Why don't, I'm going to suggest that you review this on field, on the field and take a look at it. And you and I can discern because then it's ultimately the final call gets to be with the center referee. He can either take what the VAR official says, or he can look at it himself or the VAR official may say, you need to look at this. This one's pretty tight, but I'll tell you this, that just recently, and I forget which game it was, uh, there was a slap. 
that happened behind the play. A full open hand slap to a player's face, and nobody on the field caught it, and the VAR missed it as well. Now, this player's going to end up not getting suspended because we always talk about um, sort of the the disciplinary committee and their inability to, to suspend anybody less than two games. Um, and so this player is going to get away with it, even though the referees and VAR missed this play that was was on one of the video angles and it was pretty clear that it was there. Um, there's going to be no punishment to this player and it did go down on the referee's report. Pro actually uh, told, uh, I forget which reporter was was talking about this, I think it might have been Jonathan Tannenwald who's in charge of the uh, North American Soccer Reporters, which uh, you and I are both members of. Um, but I think, I think Tannenwald talked to Pro and Pro said yes, uh, it was missed by VAR and it was actually put in their game review as well that they missed this call and this should have been a call and it should have been reviewed and it probably would have resulted in a red card ejection but the disciplinary committee didn't touch it because you can't suspend them for two games it's just that it's rules like that that are just baffle my mind it's why the disciplinary committee has is so far off base on 90 percent of what they do um they can't keep it they can't keep it very simple and and they add complexity where there probably doesn't need to be complexity i don't know what you think about this but it I've noticed in a number of games where there will be a play that's hotly contested players calling for a handball or an offside or whatever it is. And the referee will allow play to continue sometimes for a couple of minutes. And then he will stop uh, play and go over and look at the review. Well, my understanding is that at, during that period of time, the referee uh, is not sure that there's going to, that the call is going to be overturned on the field and wants to allow the game to continue the flow to continue, which I think is the correct call. And during that time, he's giving the visual, the video assistant referee a chance to take a deep dive on that call. If you were to stop play, the video assistant referee knows, Oh my God, I'm on the clock. I better make a determination really quick. We got to get this game started. Remember soccer is a game without timeouts. It's supposed to be free flowing. When you stop the game for any, any reason, whether it's a water break or an injury or a VAR review, um, you're hurting the flow of the game. You're, you're changing the way the game is supposed to be played. So I actually like when the referees allow play to continue, give the video assistant referee a little bit more time to take a look at it, and then they'll stop play. And I've actually seen a number of times where a referee has gone over, looked at the video, and then awarded a penalty kick two minutes after the play occurred, you know, that they just allowed play to continue. I like that. I like the idea that what they're trying to do is take the – the the mechanism and make it work so that it doesn't hurt the game, but that they also get the calls correct. Yeah, I, I, all that makes sense. I, I'm also okay with the delayed offside call, which I think most people freak out about. Um, but in my mind, uh, you know, there was there was some offside. Now there was a play in this game where there was a delayed offside call that was never called as well because the Galaxy ended up getting it, but they were still not in a great position. So the referees need to be smart about using the delayed offside, which is basically delay, delay, delay. This is where a linesman will will shout delay, 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 which means I think he's offside but let's let this play out to see if there's a goal scored because I don't want to get this wrong it's tight and if it's tight I'm going to keep my flag down which is what should happen again that's in that's in favor of the offense I'm always for being in favor of the offense um, on most of these things I'm not in favor of being on the offense of you know it, again if you're offside you're offside um, these are these are calls that can be made, and now they can be made down to like the half inch or the inch um, with the Hawkeye system. I'm all for I love goal line technology because goal line technology takes the argument out of it, Kevin. Nobody ever argues about goal line technology anymore uh, because whenever it goes across the line, the referee's watch buzzes, and we know it went across the line. That's it. No more arguing. Yeah. We're done. The delay call is absolutely the right call because you can take a goal off the scoreboard, but you can't add one on. Very to difficult. The scoreboard. You're very difficult when you blow the whistle and you blow it dead. I saw some of those, and Ibrahimovic was called offside, and he looked over and said, "You know, it looked pretty close. How do you how do you raise your flag on that?" Again, there was a whole bunch of argument going on um, in this game, which is no surprise. Uh, but I didn't think that outside of the offside call, I actually say that the the, the game was probably done pretty well. Um, it's not something that I'm going to sit there and, and sort of harp on. All right. Um, let's see. Anything else you want to get to? I, I know we've sort of we've covered the schedule a bunch. Um, we've covered sort of the standings and where the LA Galaxy currently sit, again, in seventh place. Uh, if, if we want, we can, we can real quickly. Uh, let's see. They are in 10th place overall in the Supporter Shield. They're in seventh place overall in the Western Conference. Uh, I expect them to drop to eighth. Uh, with with the Portland Timbers game coming up uh, this weekend, um, I will be there. By the way, oh, you will. I will be at the Portland uh, Kansas City game. Yes, sir, on Saturday. Why, what? Why are you going to that game? I just 
I actually wanted to go to a Portland Thorns game, if you want to know the truth. I wanted to take a little bit of time off uh, for my birthday. I haven't had a day off. Well, I had a day off here or there since the Women's World Cup. I need to get away. So I decided I'd just go to Portland. I wanted to see a Thorns game. The schedule didn't work. I would have had to miss an MLS game here. So we wind up going there, um, myself and the uh, lovely and talented Mrs. Panda. We wind up going there during a week when uh, the Timbers are playing. So we're going to go check that out. That sounds like fun. Uh, that's uh, that's good. Yeah, I think you'll enjoy that. Good uh, good time off for sure. Um, but yeah. one of the things that when you're talking about the schedule, yeah, there's, I, I think you can add, probably add Kansas City in on the, the, the back end. So yeah. there are, LAFC is gone. You know, they've already qualified for the playoffs. So what you have is six teams qualifying, uh, trying to get into eight, or rather eight teams trying to get into six spots. It's really a game of musical chairs. Uh, Portland, as we talked about, they have uh, one game in hand and they play six or the last seven at home. Um, so they're looking pretty good. Uh, Seattle has three at home, three on the road, Minnesota three and three. San Jose plays four of their final six away. That'll be tough for them. RSL three and three. And remember, they get the benefit of playing at altitude. Dallas um, plays two games at home and three on the road. That's big. Uh, Dallas trying to get in there. That's big because Dallas is nine, one and five at home and three, nine and two on the road. So that's going to be difficult for them. Um, the Galaxy three at home, I believe, three on the road. Uh, two of those road games at altitude, though, right. at uh, Salt Lake in Colorado. Um, certainly, the, the the schedule seems, to, if anything, I think favor the Galaxy slightly. I think they got to worry about Portland, um, Dallas. You know, their home road split that's going to be really difficult for them. San Jose as well. Um, Minnesota has LAFC, but they're going to play that game at home. Um, so I, you know, I. I, again, going into that tough streak, I thought the Galaxy would get four points. They got five. I really figured that this uh, final stretch was really going to help them. I still think they're in pretty good position. That, that's the whole thing. And, and, you know, everybody wants to focus on the other games that are sort of being played and how those affect the Galaxy. At this point, that's not that's not something that Galaxy need to worry about. Uh, they go to Colorado, and, you know, that's a game that they really, if they can win that game, is great. If they can get a point, that's also, that's not horrible. Points are points are money right now. Just get a point and do that. You you have the games. The games, they're three. Three remaining home games, those all need to be wins. You need to take nine points out of there. If you drop any points to those, you need to pick up some points um, on the road. And I certainly think that at Houston on the final day is a day that, even though it's going to be hot, it's going to be ridiculously hot. It's going to be October. It's in Houston. It's going to be humid, and it's a 1 p.m. Pacific time kickoff, which is a 2 or 3, a 3 p.m. kickoff, perhaps? Uh, they're in the central time zone. I think it's two. Um, no, it's three. No, it's like one yeah. o'clock. Uh, well, yeah, three yeah. o'clock there, one o'clock yeah. here. Yeah, three o'clock there. So it's going to be three o'clock in the afternoon, just the hottest part of the day. So that's going to be a tough game, but that is a game that potentially, if the Galaxy need points, they can win there. Now, that's not a game that you want to be worried about at the uh, at the end of the season um, and, and have to make that happen. But, you know, winning against Sporting Kansas City, even though Sporting Kansas City finally seems healthy and is winning some games, Montreal's sort of hit and miss. Uh, Vancouver has been eliminated from the playoffs. Uh, there's two teams right now, Cincinnati, and Vancouver are both eliminated eliminated from uh, the postseason right now. So hopefully Vancouver's already packed it in in the Galaxy. That's an easy win for them at the end. But you get nine points out of those, and nine points goes a long way. Now, MLS came out, and we talked about it on Thursday, and I said I don't believe it. Um, but MLS came out and said basically the Galaxy have the fifth hardest schedule um, you know, through this remaining five weeks of the season. Oh, I, I, I would argue with that. And the one thing with the Galaxy is, yes, you're, you're right. Portland probably will pass them uh, this weekend. But right now, today... Heading into the, the week, they are in playoff position. And I think they just need to focus on their game and, and not worry about the scoreboard and not say, oh, you know, RSL got lucky and they got a couple of points and how are we going to catch them? No. If they pay attention to their business and you say win their, their three home games and get a couple of points in the road games, they're okay. It's They are in control of their own destiny. Yes, other teams can pass them and other teams can hurt or help them depending on how they play against other opponents. But the Galaxy right now, today, they're in playoff position. Um, you know, it's theirs to lose. They need to concentrate on what they can do and not get into a lot of scoreboard watching because there's nothing they can do to affect those games. Yeah, not nothing at all. And and here's the other thing, and and this is realistic. Josh here, realistic understands you know what the Galaxy both are and what they are not. Um, they're an inconsistent team. Trying to peg them down and make them sort of you know better than they are, or worse than they are, is you could do either by looking into stats and digging into things. But I'll tell you, um, if you ask me straight up, Kevin, you go, hey, are the LA Galaxy better than Colorado in Colorado? And I would say yes, they should be, uh, which means that they should at least get a point and they should probably win that game. Uh, are the LA Galaxy better than Sporting Kansas City at you know Dignity Health Sports Park? Yes, they are. So there's three points. Are they better than Montreal at home? Yes, they are. That's another three points. Are they better? 
better than RSL away on the road. Maybe, maybe not. That's a draw. That's a close one. Maybe you drop points there, but that's not the end of the world if you've taken care of business in those three games before it. So that one's not the not the worst one. I think those two teams always play well against each other. Um, RSL doesn't have a, a, a head coach right now, so that's always interesting as well. So uh, we'll see how that plays down uh, that line. But, you know, can the LA Galaxy get three points on RSL? Yeah. Could they draw? Yeah. Could they lose? Yeah. Okay, so we're good with that one. Vancouver, they should beat at home. Okay, cool. Houston Dynamo should be possibly eliminated from the playoffs by then. Uh, you look at the Houston Dynamo and say, are the LA Galaxy better than the Houston Dynamo on the last day of the season with playoff implications in hand? Um, are the LA Galaxy better than the Houston Dynamo? I say yes, they are. So it's it's difficult to go through these last, um, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six games, just want to make sure, six games, and say that the LA Galaxy are in a poor position. And I'm with you, Kevin. You look at the schedule. This is a schedule the LA Galaxy can thrive upon. Um, and they should thrive upon, and there's points here to be won. Well, the, the three teams that they do play on the road, Real Salt Lake, Colorado, and Houston, despite the fact you know Houston and Colorado are basically out of it, none of, none of those teams have losing records at home. Colorado is 6-6-2, six, six, and two, Houston 7-3-4, and four, and Real Salt Lake has 10 wins and 14 games at home. So those games will be difficult. The conventional wisdom always says 50 points gets you into the playoffs. A little bit different this year with seven teams. You would think it would be easier. Actually, I think it's going to be a little bit more difficult. The Galaxy hit 42 points. Uh, if you buy the conventional wisdom, are they going to get eight points in their last six games? Absolutely. So they're going to get to 50. I don't think that's going to be enough this year. I think you're going to need 53, maybe to 55. But again, at 42 points with six games to go, I think that's more than doable. Um, the Galaxy will certainly get to 50 points. They're probably, again, going to need 53 to 55. You know, I think they're right there. But again, we got to go back to it's up to them. This is one of those situations now. It's the end of the season. Um, they can't rely. They, they can't be looking to anyone for help. It's, their, it's theirs to win. And if they don't do it, it's their fault. Uh, so there's 18 points remaining for the LA Galaxy. That's the six games times three, so 18. So, I mean, if you're a guessing man, where where do you think the Galaxy land in terms of uh, those 18 points? Do they get all 18? Uh, do they get no. the, the, how, how many do you think that they can get out of these last six games? I was, I'm was i also doing the math, by the way. Just in case you were wondering, I was also looking at this and saying, okay, where exactly does everything fit here uh, in terms of the LA Galaxy and where they fall? Um so, so, so I'm going to say they, I'm going to say they lose at Real Salt Lake. I'm going to say they get a draw at Colorado just just to be right. sort of uh, conservative. I say they get a draw at Colorado because it's at altitude. Um, Colorado's played fairly well. They got a new coach um, that, that they want to impress, Robin Frazier. So I'm going to say they drop three points to Salt Lake. They drop two points to Colorado, and then maybe I'm going to give them a draw. The Sporting Kansas City game at home. Um, that's again b just being conservative. So I think to get what you said they had 18 points. Yep. So what do I get? What did I just give them? I 13. Think 13. 18? Yeah, I think you got no, a they're, they're 55. Exactly where I think they they're going to need to be to get in the playoffs. Yeah, 12 to 13. I think uh, on mine I have 14 points. So I'm sort of with you. I think they they drop points to Colorado. I think they drop points to Real Salt Lake. Both of those games added altitude away, um, but they don't lose those games in my mind. Those are draws. Um, and I have the LA Galaxy going undefeated in these last games because I can't find a team that is better than this LA Galaxy team when the LA Galaxy are playing well. If they're not playing well, Kevin, I can't help this team in terms of trying to predict where they're going to play. But I think the second half in Seattle showed that this team is very capable of beating anybody. Um, I I still can't believe that Seattle is going to be a playoff team um, after watching them struggle to beat the LA Galaxy with 10 men at, uh, you, at you know Dignity They Hillsburg. really miss Alonzo, Oswaldo Alonzo, letting him go. That was, I mean, it's just a completely different team. And then without Ramon Torres in the back line, uh, you know, talk about a couple of guys just totally changed the complexion of a team. Here's the problem, though. If we're if we're both right and they drop points in Colorado, um, coming off the, the Seattle game and the fact that they've won, what did we say it was, one of their last seven games, that's where Guillermo Barroscolo really is going to earn his paycheck because he's going to have to go to them and say, look, we've won one of our last – at that point, be we've won one of our last eight. We just dropped points to the to the penultimate team in the division, a team that's long out of the playoff race. Um, but you know what, guys? We're still in this. This was a difficult game. It was at altitude. We're playing against Tim Howard in his you know final month of his – uh, storied career you know this was a game when Colorado was geeked up to take us out of the playoffs we're going to come back home and play Sporting Kansas City which is a tough team that's now back in the playoff race 
they need to win that game. So I think that's where, again, you're, the mental part of this is like, let's not get down. Let's concentrate on what's in front of us. Let's not let's not get into this woe is me. What do we need to do to win? He's going to have to get them fired up after that Colorado game. And they have four day turnaround to come back and play sporting Kansas City. If we're both right and they both and they drop points at Colorado, that Kansas City game becomes huge, not necessarily from the point standing, uh, stand, uh, you know, standpoint, but from the fact of mentally, where is this team? Have they gotten to the point where they say nothing's going right for us? Well, was me. Everyone hates us. Uh, the karma's against us. Or do they come back and say we're better than this? We're gonna, we're gonna, ro- you know, we're gonna run the table these last five games and and get into the playoffs. Uh, and that Kansas City game becomes huge if they don't beat Colorado. Very interesting times for the LA Galaxy. Just six games remaining. Don't play again until Wednesday, September 11th. Uh, That's against the Colorado Rapids at Dick's Sporting Goods Park in Commerce City, Colorado, just outside of Denver. Uh, That will be uh, an interesting game to watch. And the Galaxy then go Wednesday and then play at home on Sunday, September 15th. Again, see everybody at Dignity Health Sports Park there for that one um, as they'll play Sporting Kansas City. Then Montreal, um, you know, uh, coming up the next weekend. So uh, some interesting games coming up in the next three. The LA Galaxy need the points. Uh, don't be surprised again this weekend if the Galaxy drop below that red line. I don't think it's time to panic. Um, it's just results around the league sort of uh, finally leveling themselves out. Hey, this is an audiovisual pod, right? It, it can be sometimes. Why? It, what, what did you want me to show? Cause no, I, I, I just – how how does my picture look? It looks like you were a lot younger when they took this picture. That's what it looks like. I mean, you should be happy I'm using this picture. You used my high school graduation picture, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the one I was using. My high school yearbook picture. Yeah, Yeah. next time I'm just going to replace it with a picture of a panda. Uh, That's what's going to happen. So next time. 197 in panda years. Yeah, on the Monday shows, we're going to try to. They won't be live, but we're going to try to put them up on YouTube as well. Um, We know that we have sort of a growing fan base over there for the Thursday night live shows and and where those reside and sort of sit. So if you're... uh, you're a fan of seeing, uh, let's see, me, I guess, in a little more relaxed sort of mode uh, whenever I come in. This is also a holiday, so I'm just sort of in T-shirt and just sort of chilling in the in the studio today. But um, we're going to try to put I'm those more. i a suit and tie. I, I, I imagined think, I you would. This serious. I was going to say, people can't even tell if I have pants on right now, which is probably the best way. Whoa, uh, that they whoa, should always TMI. be. TMI. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, anything else? You good? I guess. All right. I would just quick reminder to everybody. Uh, we do have a t-shirt up there that is sans Panda. There is no Panda on it. Yes. yes there's don't we, buy it. Don't that, buy it. Yeah. I was going to say uh, corner of the galaxy. It's the uh, five cups uh, t-shirt that we designed. Actually I designed it about a year ago and it's just sort of been waiting for it to go, but we're sort of in end of the year fundraiser time uh, to make sure that we can continue uh, to offer you all of the website and the podcast and all that fun stuff. This just helps us offset some costs. Hey. So, if yes. you like shirts without pandas, I mean, <laughs> I can't help you. I'm sorry. I know. I know. There, there might be a hidden panda on it. Buy it and find out. Um, so Corner of the There's Galaxy. Panda. Yeah, exactly. Cornerofthegalaxy.com uh, forward slash shop. Just click on that and it'll take you there. Um, all of our other sh- shirts are always available as well. So just go to that shop button. You'll see all of them. But this one is the one we're pushing. Uh, ordered by September 18th. And I think everything ships on September 26th. So you'll have it for sort of the end of the regular season. And then, of course, into the playoffs. You'll be able to do that. And we'll, uh, when everybody Everybody gets them. We'll all wear them to a game one day, and that way uh, we can all look the same. In in terms of our individuality, we'll just you know shed that for a little while. So anyway, cornerofthegalaxy.com forward slash shop. All the money that we make off these shirts goes right back into the podcast. So we appreciate all of that support. All right, um, I think that about does it. You good now? For real? We're done. And you know how to make an artichoke? I, yeah, yeah. We heard that one last time. I'm, I'm surprised your wife still allows you to live in the house that you do. She hasn't kicked you out for that joke. Yes, I know. I know it's one of those. All right. If you're looking for Mr. Kevin Baxter on Twitter, you want to go ahead and go over to at KBaxter11 and then head over to LATimes.com for all the Southern California soccer coverage, U.S. women's national team, U.S. men's national team, soccer all around uh, here in the United States, but certainly Southern California soccer as well. Kevin has you covered, LATimes.com. Just look for the soccer section there. That's usually Kevin writing away one of his 30 or 40 stories he puts out in a week. All right. If you're looking for me on Twitter at Jay Gessman, J-G-U-E-S-M-A-N and of course at Galaxy Podcast. Uh, head on over to cornerofthegalaxy.com like I said for those shirts and obviously all of our game recaps, our previews, our shows, um, all that stuff can be found right there. Cornerofthegalaxy.com. All right. That does it. LA Galaxy off this weekend, but we will have another show coming up for you live on Thursday night, so make sure you check that one out. For Mr. Kevin the Panda Baxter, I'm Josh Pato Gessman and you've been listening to Corner of the Galaxy from the box on cornerofthegalaxy.com.
You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy From the Box podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. And for all of your independent LA Galaxy news, discussion, and entertainment, including this podcast, head on over to cornerofthegalaxy.com. Fans, thanks for listening. We ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everybody.